Arms out like pointing at me, like you do realize this is a podcast, sir. Yes, it is. Anyway, <laughs> yes, yes it's me, Deacon. And we're here with a very special guest here, Mr. Uh, Chio Coker, who is the uh, writer of Luke Cage. How's it going? Going good. Chio Hodari Coker. Chio Hodari Coker. Yeah, Chio. Yeah, you got to pronounce it. Pronounce it. Pronounce it. Chio Hodari Coker. Yeah. <laughs> pronounce it, my brother. No, you yeah. know, it's, it's always kind of weird, like just referring to yourself in the third person. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but yeah, you know. The Rock does it. So I told you, I, look, I told everybody that um, eventually, um, Comic Book Corner, we was going to get somebody, get somebody famous. We were going to get a writer or something. I messed it up. We should have got Greg Pack. I, I think we messed that. That was my fault. He was free. Technically, we he, got technically we got John Semper as our first guest. Oh yes, I forgot about Black that. Rider. Yes, yeah, we did. forgot about that. There Black Rider too. Yeah, yeah. Rider House Party, and he oh, knew yeah. Reggie Huntland and all that stuff. And, and I was he, like, um, oh my god, and he wrote um, he wrote the last run of Cyborg, Cyborg's comics. Oh wow, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah. Now the yeah. one, the one, and I just started. I think reading the one Cyborg. after, the one after David Walker. Yeah, but the one after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, they changed it up now. I forgot what he's doing now. But yeah, whatever. I don't know. Not a big deal. Anyway, <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, we we here talking about Luke Cage and music and other random shenanigans and stuff because you know we like to be different here in yeah. the podcast and stuff but um i guess first thing starting off you know for this season you know you being a music journalist and a former music journalist and such um i'm a recovering music journalist <laughs> recovering. Recovering. Yeah. Well, okay all right when you said recovering let's get that out of the way when you said recovering is it just more of who the industry <laughs> is it that? no it's it's just that like you know i can't let it go. I mean, you know, like someone could call me tomorrow to do an assignment and I would have my iPhone and a, and a legal pad to be ready to go. Ah, like, yeah. like, I mean, it's I, I love it so much. Um, the last, actually, the last piece, my retirement piece in a weird way, because I came out of retirement to do it, was when I interviewed Prince for, um, it was a cover story for Essence Magazine. Oh, wow. A writer fell through at the last moment and then I got a call from Essence, from Corey Murray. She yeah. was like, uh, you know, you, you do you want to interview Prince? I'm like, come on, really? And why, did you, why would you even ask that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Say and, no. and, and it was just crazy. It was just like, um, it was the last show that he did at the Hollywood Palladium, and he did a four hour show, four and a half hour, five yeah, hour I show. That sounds like Prince. And it was just yeah. jamming. And then right after, at three o'clock in the morning, he's like, "Do you have energy?" And so I was like, "Yeah, okay." And so he says, "He so he basically said, come by the, um, what was it, the uh, Beverly Hills Hotel?" Yeah. And he had a suite. And so I'm there, Janelle Monet is there, um, Marsha Ambrosius from Flowetry, and Dave Chappelle, and, 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 and about um, um, the brother, I can't remember his, his, his name right now, but the, the, the brother who played um, D-Rock um, in, in, in Notorious. He, uh, oh, um, we just talked about him. Yeah. We just talked about him. What um, you mean? Um, Jeez, you was just I'm, talking about. I'm it. I blanking out. Yeah, no, no, I'm, 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 and, and, and I, I feel bad because because he's a good brother. I, 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 it's, it's late. You just talking and about. My, 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 my name is um, my name is just awful. But right now, but he, <laughs> but really, he's a really, really good dude. Yeah. And you know, a bunch of other people, and it's like literally like okay, you know, Prince is in the back room, and. Um, you know, all these musicians are, are there, yeah. and and you know what it was like. It was almost like like Playboy after dark. It was just, it was it was just wild vibe. <laughs> just a bunch but, of black folk, but, 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 but like but with a bunch of black folk. Yeah. And um, this Prince's bodyguard Romeo comes out, and he's like, uh, "Excuse me, um, you know, I'm Romeo, and um, you know, Prince would, would like if um, to make sure that nobody uses any profanity." And your first reaction is get the fuck out of here. <laughs> but, 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 but nobody wants to get kicked out. But, but nobody wants to get kicked out. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so then everybody agrees to it. And so Dave Chappelle is sitting at the piano and literally starts playing like round midnight. But like the felonious monk, like yeah. like people don't know like Dave Chappelle can play piano. And he's just like, dude. And you're like, what? Dave Chappelle? Can play <laughs> like, and then but like playing well. And you're like, what? <laughs> You know, and it, and, and, it, and it had been a couple of years since anybody really seen him, right? Yeah. And so he's like buff. He like he, he I see him working out or something. So he's buff. Dave Chappelle playing felonious monk style, round midnight. 
And he's like, yeah, so, you know, he said, of course, you know, I'm from, you know, um, I, I went to, I guess, Duke Ellington, whatever. Yeah, he went to Duke Ellington, yeah. You know, from here. So, ironically, we're here. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, of course. I'll be basically, like, I'm from Dave Chappelle. I'm versatile. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, then, and, then, <laughs> and then, you know, Prince comes out. So then he's hanging out, and then um, I joke when I say this, but was was Prince floating on floating in the middle of the air, just <laughs> Prince just was, gliding in on a on a cloud of smoke? <laughs> I, I swear to God, the thing that was interesting about the brother was that just even though, like, yes, okay, you know, if you're gonna, you know, Charlie Murphy, rest in peace, would say that he's dressed like a figure skater. <laughs> I, I mean. <laughs> The brother was, he, he was regular. It was the weirdest thing. He was just yeah. like mellow. And so, right. so, in his own element, he really was. And so he comes and sits down, and we're talking for a second. And in my head, I'm just like, oh, I can't believe we're talking to Prince, but let me be cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so we're talking, and then he plays something on the piano, and he's kind of teasing Janelle Monet, and it was, it was just really just mellow. Yeah. So then he says, you want to talk? So I say, sure. So we go back into his room. And I'm sitting up for, across from Prince, no further than you, we, yeah. we're, we're yeah. speaking right now. Yeah. And we, he's talking about music, talking about the music industry. He's talking all all these things, and so I just like he he allows me to take notes because I we, I couldn't record it. Yeah, and I'm scribbling like crazy, <laughs> like like just just trying to get anything I can. Mm-hmm. And so push comes to shove. I, I was actually working on um on Ray Donovan at the time. Um, I, I was a co executive producer of that TV show, for second yeah. season. And so I was on deadline, and I get a call from Essence. They're like, if we don't get the piece by noon, it's not running. So I pulled I pulled the car over seven o'clock in the morning. I, I, I was by Soho House and in L.A. and I went upstairs and I just wrote the piece in one sitting. You know, yeah. what was interesting because I had been screenwriting for a while. My style had changed, so everything was just really terse and matter of fact and just visual mm-hmm. and just as it yeah. was. Yeah. And then it turns out in a weird way that was the best thing that it could have been because um, Prince read the piece. And then he calls me directly. You get a phone call. And then someone says, like, you know, um, it's Prince. And you're like, whoa. <laughs> you know? Because you, you, you're like, still, this, even though Did he just so, say, this is Prince? You know? <laughs> you know and, 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 I think and, that's all right. This is Prince. Yeah, but like, you're like, his voice. And you're yeah. like, and, you're, and then he's like, um, he liked the piece. And, and he basically, and he says to me, he's like, you know, it's the first piece that I've read and, in 10 years where somebody didn't actually try to put themselves into the piece as an, with an agenda. Yeah. And I really like like what you did. And um, I'm going to, I want to fly you to Minneapolis. Oh, so snap. flies me to Minneapolis, you know, so, you know, I, I go to Paisley Park and um, I remember I was in the waiting room at Paisley Park to say no photos. I didn't take any photos, but I couldn't resist. I, I like, it was like a museum almost for Prince. And I, I couldn't resist. I, I I touched the bike from Purple Rain. It was like right there. And so, was like, <laughs> so I couldn't help myself. It, it was, you know, the motorbike yeah. was right there. And I, I, just, I just went like, Doop, and I touched it. <laughs> and then, you know, Prince comes out. He's like, hey, what's up? And he invites me back in the studio B. And he's playing me, you know, um, the record that, the, you know, um, the Artificial Age, uh, you know, whatever that was, the, the last yeah, record. Yeah, the yeah, last yeah. record. I didn't hear. I'll be honest with you. I did not hear. It, uh, I heard probably one or two songs about him. I don't remember. But he played that. He played the song Clouds, and then he started, and then he played me Third Eye Girl because they were actually there, and mm-hmm. they were like performing in rehearsal space. So we got in his car. He played me more music. It was Prince Fantasy Camp. Yeah, yeah. And he's and um, the thing was was that was my first. The reason I'm I'm telling the story, like why the hell are we doing doing the Prince story? Yeah. That was my first interaction with Netflix because Prince asked me to do a TV series for Netflix. Oh wow! Based, it was going to be. Um, Essentially, what it was going to be, it was going to be um, Paisley Park, but it, uh, it was it, the whole thing. Uh, actually, I think he called it New Power Generation. What he wanted to call it, he wanted to kind of do like a docu series about building a, a brand new New Power Generation. Mm-hmm. And my whole thing at the time was he wasn't going to appear in it, and I was trying to Jedi mind trick him into appearing in the series. Into but but, 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 but yeah. that that was going to be the thing that that was going to, you know, I was going to showrun that. And then, like, it, the deal never quite... It was real, because it went yeah. up to the highest levels of Netflix. Yeah. The deal never quite materialized. And then around this time was... At the same time, I you know, I, I was going into Marvel to meet on Luke Cage. Um, I, I'd done a couple of days' work on Straight Outta Compton. Yeah. And I'd written a pilot for, for Q-Tip based on, on, on A Tribe Called Quest. And one of these things was going to land because I, you know, I left Ray Donovan or, or Ray Donovan left me because <laughs> when, when, when Ann Bitterman left, um, I was axed as, as um, and um, Ron Nyeswander, who now writes on um, 
um, on Homeland. He was also axed because we were ant loyalists. Yeah. So yeah. That's how it goes when we forgot there was a bunch of there was like a, not yeah. even a, a, like a mini exodus of that on show. I forgot about that. Yeah, and so I was part of that exodus. Um, and then so basically, I got Luke Cage and started you know working on Luke Cage, and he was cool with that. And um, you know the thing that was crazy about it was. My whole plan, the reason that, that we have the swear jar in mm-hmm. season one was I was going to invite him into Harlem's Paradise. My whole <laughs> goal was let me get through the pilot and second episode and I'm going to show Prince the first two episodes and I think he's going to dig it. I mean, because Prince, Prince loved black people. He yeah. loved anything yeah. black. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, like like that, the Issa Rae joke, like I'm, I'm voting for everybody black. That yeah. was Prince. Yeah. <laughs> and like... I figured that if I showed him the first two episodes, he would dig it. And my plan was for him to perform in the finale. Oh, man. And um, in the midst of that, um, it was crazy because I was actually, the day day that Prince died, I was actually at MGM having my first meeting with the executive, Adam Rosenberg, who who eventually would hire me to write Creed 2. Yeah. Um, And, you know, he was like, we just started the meeting, it was morning meetings. Oh, man. I guess he got the the alert on 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 his phone. It's like, what? He said, Prince died. And I was just like, I couldn't finish the meeting. I was the first oh, time. Yeah. I, yeah. I was stunned. But yeah, no, that was the thing. So every time I think, I, every time I see the square jar, even of course though it's it's a Luke Cage thing, I always think about Prince, and I always mm-hmm. like wonder, mm-hmm. like, man, like I, I like it would have been cool to get him on the show, and and I, I would have loved to have shown him the show because I, I really think the fact that you just brought up Prince. Like Prince has something to do with Luke Cage. I think that just blows everybody's mind around that. Yeah. You know what? When it comes to you were saying, when you were approached with doing Luke Cage, period, did you already have something in mind of what you wanted to do and what the um, show wanted to do? Like what the producers and everybody Wait. else. Yeah. The question was um, when you were approached with um, um, doing Luke Cage, how much of it did you say, okay, I'm going to make this my vision? Within reason, like how much leeway did um, the executives and they give you when it came to building this world of at least your version of of this Harlem? Well, they didn't really approach me. It's like you basically, it's like Survivor. It's, yeah. it's like a number of I don't even know who my competition yeah, was. You but been anybody, a yeah. number of us went in there, and then I went in with my perspective. And I remember I went into the pitch. It was like you kind of level up every time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I went into my pitch. I had a I had a um, a copy of the first issue of Luke Cage, I had a, I had a Luke Cage, um, you know, doll. <laughs> um, was it and, original Luke Cage? Yellow, um, the yellow jumpsuit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 that, that Luke Cage, you know, it was one of those original series dolls. And then I had um, a picture of my grandfather. Mm. And because um, my grandfather, it's the same picture that of my grandfather that, that's actually on, on, on the cover of my Twitter feed. Yeah, because my grandfather was a Tuskegee Airman. Like mm-hmm. that, that's yeah. not that's not a random picture of a Tuskegee Airman. Nice. That, that's, yeah, my, yeah. That, that, that's my actual grandfather. My family, you know, yeah, yeah. L- Lieutenant Colonel Bertrand Wilson. He's actually buried in Arlington, Arlington National Cemetery. Oh wow! Like not far mm-hmm. from here at all. Um, but we, I went in, I pitched, and I basically talked about my grandfather and what it was like to basically be the grandson of a, of a black hero. And what I had originally pitched was, I said, what if the first black superhero was more Mike was more Allen Iverson than um than Jackie Robinson like what 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 if he was oh, yeah. what if he was more you know like or, or, or like Michael Vick style like where this you know yeah. this this brilliance but then there's also a certain level of darkness I mean my, you know, it's Michael Vick by far is my, my favorite NFL yeah. player yeah, yeah, yeah you know but the thing was it was um that's not quite what they were talking about what they were talking about was like they wanted more of a reluctant hero. And they said, we, yeah. we, we like you. We like your pitch. You know, I, I was so nervous. Like, um, I'd been in pitches before where there's always, like, there's always something to trip you up with. So I came yeah. in. I came into that pitch more prepared than anything I'd ever come in with in my life. Mm-hmm. Down to the point where I had, um, you know, episodes in mind. So if they said lay out the full season, I was going to lay out the what, whole thing. what I thought all <laughs> yeah. 13 episodes were going to be. That. And that. that's how I started using the song titles was because I got nervous the day before. I said, let me relax. You know, I, I'm a huge Grey's Anatomy fan. And Grey's Anatomy, like, they used to always name every episode after popular songs. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I said, okay, let me pick some songs. I'm going through, like, iTunes and Gangstar songs. Just kept, <laughs> they, they resonated. So I just picked 13 Gangstar songs. And I said, okay, I'm going to weave a a Luke Cage story through this just in case 
And, you know, it never really got that far, but they, they sensed that they liked what I had to say. Mm -hmm. um, and then Jeff Loeb was actually, you know, the president of Marvel Television and Kareem Zrake, you know, the other co-head, they were in that meeting. Mm -hmm. And what got me the job beyond my pitch was when they, when, was they said, okay, well, what's your vision? Mm -hmm. I said, my vision of the show is, you know, City of God meets Belly. Written by the staff of the Wire. Yeah. And yeah. And, <laughs> it makes about sense. Oh, yeah. And, and and the crazy thing about it was, it was Belly that got me the job because because, <laughs> Yo. because Jeff Loeb. I didn't know this at wait, the time. Wait, wait, wait. Jeff Loeb is really close friends with Hype Williams. It was, wow. it was like Yo. it was just random yes. things. And and, and 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 he was like. He's like, you've seen Belly? And I'm saying, I said, Jeff, I'm black. I'm black. I, belly. <laughs> I, I, I guess for him. You've seen Belly? I, I, guess I didn't him, know the Negro folk <laughs> like that. <laughs> I, I guess for Jeff, it was like this kind of, like, um, you know, this obscure thing. I'm, I'm like, come on. If you're black in your 20s, everyone's seen Everybody's Belly. Everybody's seen Belly. And, yeah. and, and he, but he, 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 he was like, yeah, because hype. And I mean, he just well, dug it. <laughs> and so that was the thing was like, you know, so I get the gig and I'm ecstatic. I mean, yo. I knew what the opportunity was because it wasn't like write a pilot and hope and pray that it gets greenlit. Exactly. It was yeah. like mm -hmm. it was thirteen episodes. Add water. Jessica Jones was up. Um, um, Daredevil was 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 filming, and what they did was they um, they gave me the first uh, two episodes of um, in terms of the scripts. The first two scripts for you know for Daredevil. So Drew Goddard's first two scripts. Mm -hmm. And they gave me Melissa Rosenberg's first two scripts for Jessica Jones. And I read them and I just was I was just like, man, holy shit. What the fuck am I gonna do? <laughs> because A, the scripts were brilliant. They really oh, yeah. were. Yeah. But the second thing was, oh my God, you know, you had definitive villains. Daredevil was clearly gonna it was gonna be telling a, a, a Daredevil Kingpin story. Yeah, exactly. And then with Jessica Jones, Kilgrave was mm -hmm. a definitive villain. Mm -hmm. exactly. You know, even though they made it different than the alias graphic novel. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, okay, what? I'm gonna have Luke go against Mr. Fish? I'm like like <laughs> because there were so many you know, the thing about Hero for Hire in terms of the comic is every single issue was basically a one off. There was mm -hmm. no real definitive yeah, there was none villain. Yeah, because yeah. we were joking around and on that's the aspect wanted... of thinking, of like, well, maybe Luke was going to fight Tombstone. Because that's, yeah. like, the first thing that just yeah. clicks in my head was Tombstone. And I was telling you the same thing. Like I, like, I always had that problem when it came to at least mostly the black characters. That's DC, Marvel, whomever. We always have these either one-off characters. And when we do get the big character, it's like, well, he's just the B character. He's just the B villain of that, yeah. of the bigger character or something like that. So I always had that problem. So, yeah, you did mention that, like, Tombstone is the only <laughs> black black bad guy I can really think of all the time. Oh, no, Tombstone. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Like, hey, dude, you said something about Brother Voodoo showing up. Like, why? <laughs> well, but, but that was what was so interesting was so, like, Tombstone, of course, is the, it's, he's somehow... Um, he's Spider-Man. He's most Spider-Man. Yeah, so he's Sony. Anything. So anything yeah, Spider-Man yeah, related, yeah. Marvel is yeah, Sony. Yeah. That, that's just, yeah. that's just yeah. it. Yeah. You know, and so, like, I'm just kind of... Okay. It could have been possibly been a Diamondback story. Which, but here's the thing, because of Jessica Jones' treatment of Reva, yeah, and because that's what kind of took the whole thing off off the board of them being best friends and being yeah. crooks together, and then him following, like following the you know the story, yeah. So that was gone. So I was like, okay, let me just figure this out. And then I was lucky because I, you know, I had to come in back over the weekend at, cause when I kind of semi had the job, but had to come back with what the story was going to be. And I was just like, I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna do. And <laughs> and then I was lucky because um, one of the things that they told me was that they wanted to kind of slow burn. They wanted to do a story where you have a reluctant hero who kind of comes back. And yeah. mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, okay, I, I don't know. And then thank God, um, it was roughly the same time that the Equalizer came out. Mm. And then when I saw Denzel, because I'm, 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 I'm old, I'm, Anton Fuqua is is one of my oldest like in terms of Hollywood is, is is one of my oldest Hollywood friends cool. you know and, and a mentor um, although like my, my, my true Hollywood mentor directors wise is, is John Singleton who I've been friends with for, for many many years but you know my, my uncle Richard who Michael Richard Wesley who wrote um, 
Uptown Saturday Night, let's do it again. He is my is my true mentor. He wow. he's the one really the first that taught me how to Uncle. um yeah, how to screenwrite. Wow. But deep cuts. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, like, but I told you black Hollywood kinda got to you know, stay together. But, yeah. but but the thing was 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 when I saw it equalizer, I was like, Okay, I, I get it. Mm-hmm. And then I just started thinking about Westerns and uh, then I started thinking about okay, it's like you have Luke Cage kind of like coming it's kind of a classic Western story. It's yes, basically yes. you have a brother who's the man with no name who's, you know, working and just trying to keep a low profile. And one guy knows who he is. Say, hey, man, things are really bad around here. You really change things. <laughs> He's like, nah, nah, I'm good, I'm good. And then you have the evil saloon owner, <laughs> you yeah, know, who, you go. Who, who, who controls the town. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and that becomes Harlem's Paradise. Lennox Avenue becomes, you know, our um, our old one, you know, the, the, the one road in town. Yeah, one, you know? that one main strip. And then, you know, you've, you've got the kind of femme fatale slash love interest who bolsters the hero. You know, of course, that's going to be misty to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. And it was just kind of followed a classic Western tropes. And then, you know, my thing was with the music was like, you know, um, I knew that hip hop had, had, had to be, you know, the pulse. But I wanted to do it different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, the thing was, was that... Um, Two of my friends in the music industry, really close friends. One of them was Gary Harris, the late Gary Harris, who was really, you know, who was very close, kind of a de facto manager to Q-Tip, really close with Q-Tip. Mm-hmm. He was the one who said, yo, like, um, I don't know if you're up on this guy, Adrian Young, but you really should, should, um, you know, talk to Adrian. And then at the same time, of course, also said, yo, you, you should also talk to Ali Shaheed Muhammad because, you know, He's also out in LA, you know, and I, and I, I knew I've known Ali forever. Yeah. Um, and then at the same time, my friend Dante Ross, you know, legendary A and R man who like discovered like, uh, you know, what, what, Everlast De La Soul, like I mean, yeah, been behind the KMD, he's been old dirty bastard, been like yeah. behind a lot of artists. He also mentioned Adrian, and so I got two people that I knew that weren't talking to to each other, both you mentioning the same Adrian person, Young. Yeah. And then um, my other friend, Naeem Ali, who said, yo, I, yo, I can get to Ali. Ali's, you know, again, also saying Ali's out here. Yeah. What I didn't realize at the time was that both Adrian and Ali were working together already. They were already working on records together. So I met with them, and then it just became, it was perfect. Yeah. You know, I also flirted a little bit with, with, with um, DJ Premier, and, and, and Premier's also the homie. Yeah. So, so it was using Gangstar. You gotta get so <laughs> that was you know that that was a possibility. But like, but he also was already scoring. I mean, he was working on. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to think what, what show it was um, off the top of my head. Um, the breaks. He was he was scoring. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember. At, yeah, at, I remember at the that. Time. Yeah, hmm. but um, you know that was the thing was with Adrian Young and Ali Shaheed Muhammad. They they talked about orchestra. They talked about score. They they talked about Ennio Morricone. They 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 had a whole different perspective, and so that was my thing. Was that I was gonna, I basically was gonna build the music first, mm-hmm. and then we just kind of as a as a writing staff, you know, myself, Charles Murray, you know, Christian Taylor, Jason Horwich, Akela Cooper, Ida Kroll, um, Matt Owens, Nathan Jackson. Um, you know, we just basically just wanted to do something different. Yeah. And, you know, that's kind of how everything kind of came together. Yeah. You know, um, for me, it was really, the music was always the center. Yeah. And I used it, like, the, all that music experience to kind of build the, the, the sound. The other influence on me was, honestly, the, um, because I noticed, I was thinking about, like, how are these shows this binging how's it consumed differently and yeah um it kind of i thought about back in the day like if the prince record dropped or if or if, if midnight marauders or or the chronic or these other records came out everybody shut down everything mm, yeah. yeah and they would listen to the whole record twice mm-hmm. and then you would get on the phone and talk to your friends and you know of course now with everything you know, the internet it's just it's different. Listen to an album at midnight and then like by one o'clock or right, i already worked listen to the whole thing and i'm done <laughs> but i realized that really the only time that people do that previously was records mm-hmm. and now with these TV shows that, that that's how they consume it yeah. so okay if you made a television show that was like a record you might have similar impact yeah. and then at the same time you know the, the, the Beyonce record you know the first self-titled Beyonce record that was the record videos yeah. and all that shit 
all together came out. So I kind of called that Beyonce season one and eliminated, <laughs> you know, Beyonce season two. And so I said, okay, like, that's an interesting concept. I mean, yeah. so essentially, you know, I, I look at Luke Cage season one and Luke Cage season two as concept albums. You know, with no, dialogue. That makes, sense. That yeah. makes very. That but makes I mean, so like, sense. like, because the whole thing with season two that I thought was interesting is like the whole thing with Bushmaster. You know, he's from the Caribbean and stuff. So, like, the music that you're using in there, there is a lot of Caribbean influence. So, how did you actually go about like picking the music for that? Because I know that this season is different. Well, a round of music now. Well, because the thing was, okay, if season one was was the Wu Tang vacation of the Marvel Universe. Season two was like, okay, what's the roots of hip hop? Exactly. The root of hip hop is is like. R and B, soul, mm-hmm. blues, funk, yeah. all kind of come, you know, all cousins of each other. Yeah, from the Black American musical experience, mm-hmm. but then reggae is all. It's also a cornerstone of, oh, yes, of hip hop because since you know Cool Herc, you know through that the, you know the the first hip hop party from Sedgwick on Sedgwick Avenue, you know in the Bronx, and you know and the fact that he is from you know he grew up in Jamaica, grew up in Kingston, until yeah. he was thirteen years old. Yeah. You know, I said, okay, like, we can show both. And then kind of looking through, like, Luke Cage villains and then seeing the fact that, okay, in the comics that Bushmaster John, John MacGyver is, is from a mysterious small island in the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah. I said, okay, well, then let's make it Jamaica. Let, let, let's be really specific about it. Might as well. <laughs> because Jamaica has always been, like, the island of magic and of resistance and of power and pride. Yeah. And so... Mm-hmm. You know all things that I love, uh, you know, as a black person, and so, you know, and you have two different immigrant experiences. You've got that, fa- you know, the MacGyver family immigrant experience, and you also have the, um, you know, the Stokeses coming from the, the deep south, mm-hmm. coming coming to the north. Right. And so, one of the things that Marvel and Netflix were both insisting on, they were like, well, they're like, cause the first it was about okay, somebody coming to come to town to kick Luke Cage's ass. Luke Cage yeah. is bold. And yeah, then anytime you get bold, yeah. and you get exactly. cocky, that's when you get knocked out. Exactly. Because one of the biggest metaphors from the season was anybody, you know, the Mike Tyson quote, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Oh, <laughs> man, listen, that, that was, that was, that, yeah, I definitely caught that. that. That was my favorite quote of all, of Mike Tyson of all time. I'm a, huge, I'm a huge boxing fan. And so people were like, well, why is Bushmaster come to town? And, you know, because the thing that's interesting about both Marvel and Netflix, they... You don't get bad notes from either company because they're really smart <laughs> and they're really passionate, and yeah. that's what's hard. Is is like half half the job as a show owner is figuring out which note to follow and which which note to politely say we're not doing not that. Yet. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. you know they're both on both sides are asking why is okay you have Bushmaster but why is he coming to town? Why is he coming to kick Luke's ass? You know, and does he have to be Jamaican? Like, you, you know, yes, he's Jamaican, but can he have an American accent? Like, no, no. <laughs> Why would they do this? Well, yeah, I know. I, I mean, no, but, no, 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 no. You know, yeah. so I, you know, and so I said, I said, no. Like, we, I really want to go like authentic, and and you know, um, myself and and Aida Kroll, who was who um, elevated from being a producer on season one to being my number two on season two. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we um, just insisted like we're gonna do the uh, the authentic Jamaican for real. Yeah. And the room, everybody in the room for season two. Um, the the only real changes for season two in terms of the writing staff was that um, Matt Lopes, who was the writer's assistant, got elevated to staff writer. Mm-hmm. Charles Murray, um, that's my you know my man, my ace. Actually, at the time, ap- um, after season one, left to run Star. Oh. Nice. Um, and and also do, like do some other stuff on on, on an overall. Um, you know, Jason Horwich and um, Christian Taylor um, moved on. And um, but it was everybody else like I had continuity because everybody that was on season one, well, you know, you yeah. know, stuck. And then we and then we, we added two new writers. <coughs> we added um, Ian Stokes from Iron Fist. Oh, okay. Um, and we also added um, Nicole Morante Matthews, um, who um, was a non Marvel writer, but just really was just really a great storyteller. Yeah. Um, and so that was the season two staff, you know. With us, so, so we had a lot of continuity. So yeah. we, we had people that really knew the show, um, and um, we decided, hey, look, okay, we're, we're going to tell the story. And, and and they kept asking us, why Bushmaster? Why Bushmaster? <laughs> and so it was just like, okay, like let's. What are we thinking? Like, how do we how do we get this right? And it just took us a minute. And then what we realized, okay, okay, Luke is the sheriff of Harlem. All he cares about is keeping the peace. So the reason that. Bushmaster comes to town is is because of Mariah Stokes. 
as he insists, Mariah Stokes. <laughs> you know, it's like not which, Dylan which, Stokes. Which, which, which of course, but like we should actually do a Luke Cage drinking game. Like every time he says Stokes, Stokes, Stokes yeah, but it's like, like like you got to take a shot or something. But um, and then then it became okay, okay. So you know he's af- he knocks out Luke Cage, but she's the real target. But then again, the other question, both companies, why? And then it didn't really solidify until. Um, I had to, I almost had like this this revelation. I said, okay, it's got to be about the rum. And I said, okay, if you think about a club and you think about prohibition, and we in last season in season one we talked about how the club had the tunnels had because tunnels. of prohibition yeah, yeah, yeah. and all this other history. So I said, okay, what if these? What if we kind of borrow from you know Malcolm X and Red Fox? People didn't know this, but Malcolm X and Red Fox um, were dishwashers yeah. in Harlem. Wow, mm-hmm. both of them were. You didn't know that? No, I didn't know. You know. I hate that I know history. Go ahead. And, 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 <laughs> and that was the thing. Like they had this. They were they were really tight, cause, and that's how they knew each other. Because you know, Red he was Detroit Red. Yeah. You yeah. know, Malcolm X was, was um, and the other Red was was the really funny Red. The, the you know the Red from Jimmy's Chicken Shack, yeah. and, and that was Red Fox, and they and they were tight. Mm-hmm. And so I said, okay, so imagine like these two guys washing dishes decide to you know what, let's open a club, and one of them says. You know, I, I learned how to make rum in Jamaica because I'm Jamaican. And the other guys said, like, okay, well, yeah, hell, I was a bootlegger down south, you know. So, like, let's and, – and, and my my um, brother plays guitar. So, like, why don't we have our own club? And that club becomes Harlem Paradise and mm-hmm. build the backstory. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, once we got the backstory together as a room, then I, then we knew, like, okay, like, we, could, we can layer this shit. Yeah. Um, and then it just became all these different things. And what the great part about that was that it allowed everybody to have a history. There's a Stokes history. There's a MacGyver history. You've got Luke Cage, and we're talking about family legacies. And when we bring Luke's father into it, because of what happened in the past with Old Diamondback of yep. it all, yep. you it have all a coming. family drama on top of a superhero show. And you know, family dramas, you know, are really big, and, and you know, are really big because two of the biggest stories of all time. I mean, the Corleones is a yeah. yeah. family drama. <laughs> the Skywalkers are a family drama. Family drama. So. I think. Well, I, I also think just people just like when you have these characters who are already fleshed out, who are already three-dimensional, when there's lore that is just as built and just as respected, you have that background. Oh, yeah, it, it makes perfect sense yeah. to have something like that. And I always love it when they, there's more to a backstory like that. And yeah. and I don't, I really, I really do love the fact that you just decided Jamaica because uh, you know when you when they in Caribbean Bushmaster first thing I thought like he's gonna be African. I just, yeah, I was, that was the first thing I thought. He's gonna be African or Netflix gonna make him Brazilian just for no fucking reason, whatever it be. <laughs> and, and, and trust me, they they, they were they I mean, you know like you know with to to to, to protect the innocent and the guilty. You know, we got the notes like, you know, can it be an African warlord? I'm like, no. See, yeah, that's another one. They always but he got you, but he got but used in Defenders. It was the one that, that yeah. you know, I was like, eh, we're be kind of retreading and, and, it a little and, bit. And, and you know, in my back pocket, because the thing for me is all music, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I love Fela, and so if we lost the Jamaica battle, <laughs> like the, the the musical base was going to be Afrobeat, yeah. and it was going to be like oh, Fela yeah. and, and, and Hugh Massa Kayla, and, and, and like, yeah. so I, I we had a backup plan. Oh, yeah. But luckily, we were still able to to just you know insist. Like second, I saw him doing that kick. Though, I was like, "Hey, man, in Brazilian. I'm yeah. not mad at that." But, well, <laughs> but even with that, like the reason we had Capoeira was because we wanted an African based something, yeah, style something that, that we would made. be that would be different. Yeah, and I think that's that does, that falls upon him just even being Jamaican. Yeah, like I was thinking, like well. You know, somebody said that he couldn't be Haitian or something. It doesn't matter. I think at that point, especially when you have a country, like, I like how you say Jamaica, which what it stands for, at least to Americans, how we see it, how they are an independent country, and how they ran. And you, when you hear Jamaica, you instantly think of that music. You think about this nation of hard work and strong people and all oh, the rest man. of it. And yeah. then you combine that, the fact that I'm taking this block back and forth. <laughs> Like we always, yeah, bro, I like that. I always like that. Yeah, but I mean, I think the one thing, like I said, I remember when we did non spoiler review. I was like, I like the aspects. I was not expecting you to put in like Luke's Luke Cage and his dad because like one of the things in the comics, and I think your show does a good job of it, is in the comics, they never really dived into yeah. his relationship with his dad. Like I think the Al Ewing did uh, the Mighty Avengers, and they touched on it. And I joked with the fact that Luke's dad in the comics, he had an adventure with Blade. And right. Blue Marvel back in the 70s. 
And Luke is like, you didn't tell me this back in the day, did you? Wait, wait, like, wait, 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 wait. Blue Marvel 2? Yeah. Blue, per- perfect Afro and all, man. Like, perfect Afro and all. And I was like, hey, man. you know what, Al? You're, you're awesome in my book. You did that. And it's like, in this, and I like in the show, you know, you made him a pastor. And you, just like, you know, first season and stuff. And I like how their relationship, it wasn't shotgun. Like, oh, they resolved in the episode. No, that was like a full season. You got to do family drama, right? You're going to do, yeah. do it right, man. Black people love drama, man. Yeah, but and, I mean, and, 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 we, we always do. And, and our families, every fa- every every Thanksgiving, every family reunion, there, there's there's some fight, there's some you know some something somebody finds out, <laughs> somebody <laughs> says something, someone got a second, third family, uh-huh. like it's always something. Some there's one. always some. There's definitely tea to be sipped somewhere. I mean, was there ever a temptation, even when you had both of them working it out, that like? Maybe we could throw Diamond back in here, or was it? I mean, did anybody ever throw that idea in there? Well, the thing was, was like you know, like I, I love Diamond back as a character, yeah, and I even liked what we did with him season one. Um, the thing was, was that I didn't anticipate how angry people were going to be <laughs> when we killed Cottonmouth, <laughs> and, and 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 you have to understand why. Um, we well, don't have to understand, but oh yeah, yeah, we know why. But but let me explain it to people so they don't so they. So they get it. So yeah, if you yeah, want to blame yeah. me, let me give you some context. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cottonmouth was always going to die. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was the pitch. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was the second pitch that got me the job. Because oh, okay. I said, I want to kill, I want to, I want to make people fall, I want to do a psycho kind of thing where I make people fall in love with a character mm-hmm. and then we're going to kill him and replace it with a second villain. Mm-hmm. Because then it gives you like a shift because one of the things... I talked about structurally is first episode, first act, second episode, second act, third episode, third act, fourth episode is always a twist. Yep. So you always have ri- yeah. rising action all the mm-hmm. way to the end of the mm-hmm. finale, which kind of caps and yeah. redoes that. Um, that was the plan. Um, and what influenced that was as a comic book geek, I remember just how I felt reading um, issue number 12 of Alpha Flight. Mm-hmm. When Guardian exploded on the last frame and he mm-hmm. and he died, yeah, like in Heather, you know, Heather Hudson's like, you know, he's disintegrated. He's like, <laughs> it's like he's dead. He's like, yo, like I that blew my mind as a kid. And I also remember, of course, also, um, you know, my favorite Spider-Man story, Craven's Last Hunt, oh, man. and Good one. all those months, like because people don't remember this, this is before they compiled the books when you actually had to go to a comic book store and mm-hmm. actually buy the issues. Those two or three months when you really thought Spider Man was dead, yeah. and there was no indications, there was no internet, there was no like <laughs> no you, were just, you were just like, "Wizard didn't exist like, at the time, know, right? none of that." Like I can't believe he's dead, and so I want, I, like, I wanted that feeling. Yeah. And when we were doing auditions, like at first we thought that we were going to cast an older um, Cottonmouth. Yeah. Like my model for him was Ving Rhames. And, you know, because that kind of matched the, the older look, you know, in the comic book. Yeah, yeah that's right, yeah. And then, and we knew, and we also knew that we can get Alfred Wood. We got lucky with Alfred, like, you know, in terms of that. So we thought that maybe, okay, we would have to be older, older, more set in the way, Harlem Hustlers. And then, um, but it was, it was actually Eric Larry Harvey who played Diamondback. It was his audition for Cottonmouth. It was mm. so strong. <laughs> it, you know, as much as people want to diss Eric Lloyd Harvey for Diamondback, he almost was Cottonmouth. He had, I don't. He, he had. A great, I would have bought it. I would have bought that. I would have bought. He it. had a great audition. I watched Boardwalk Empire. So yeah. off the brails, like he, yeah, he, he works. He was. He was. He was, he was scary. He was the shit, and he was so strong that we said, okay, if we are going to hold to this plan, we're going to need somebody strong to hold up the back half. Mm-hmm. And so now that we're going younger, let's let's cast Eric as Diamondback. And let's figure out who's going to be Cottonmouth. And so the whole thing was, okay, we tr- we're, just, we're just racking our brains. Who can we get who's available? Who's going to be Cottonmouth? And eventually we were running out of time and we couldn't really think of anybody. And um, Lorraine Mayfield, who's um, one of the casting directors mm-hmm. and also, of course, cast all the Marvel shows and also cast um, House of Cards. She said, what about Marshall Ali? And I'm like, what, the brother of 4400? <laughs> and, 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 See, I told you I wasn't the only one that watched that. <laughs> and, 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 I totally forgot he was in it too for a second. That's the only reason doesn't. why I watched it, dude. And, <laughs> and the thing was, he was great for that. I was like, yeah. And, they, and she said, yeah. And, he, and you, you watch House of Cards? And like, yeah. Well, he's I, great in House of Cards. I, I love my House of Cards, but like Remy is a gangster. Like, I don't know. Yeah. You, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm not trying to knock you. Not, you didn't see that? 
Well, I mean, but, I mean, but, I saw it because I, I know, I know, but yeah, okay, granted, yeah, granted. I, I mean, he had edge. his roles he, really kind of. He yeah. had edge, but it wasn't like it wasn't the obvious choice that that. Well, yeah, true. Because like, he was like the smart brother in House true. of Cards. Yeah, you like, know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. like, like he, he was the business brother. Like, you yeah, know, yeah. It, it, and and then it was like, but, I, like, but I'm like, okay, like I read the, I read this this interview that he had, and you know, talking about hieroglyphics and. For, you know, I completely forgot about the fact that he was an MC, and so yeah. I said, "Okay, he's gonna get the hip hop element of it." So let's just roll the dice, and thank God, because the second he walked on set, and the second we had the first table read, it was like, "Yo," <laughs> and, and like, just and, the and, intimidation of him. I don't know. Yeah. Like I said, I don't and, know how and, nobody saw that. I but, knew he had. He he is the most mellow, nicest, soft spoken, polite brother you will ever meet. He he reminds you one of like 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 one of them old school like. Like like Muslim like Islam, like like real real yeah yeah real like, straight, like, like, yeah. Like, like, like a gentleman like yeah. like through and through yeah and then all of a sudden it was just like it was when we had when we shot the first scene in the barbershop. yeah um it was after that that I, like because I was on set in New York and I called the writing staff at L A and I said you know what we gotta completely rewrite everything we thought for this character because everything we were doing before was so arch and not understated we said like. He just changed. He just yeah. changed the whole tempo. Yeah, like, we we got to do this different. And he and Mahershala, um, I learned so much from him in terms of writing for actors mm-hmm. because um, he just always had questions, and his questions were always about you know Cottonmouth's backstory and it uh, forces as a writing staff mm-hmm. and me in particular to yeah. think about like what his history was. Yeah, and that's how we kind of built that the backstory of Stokes. And, you know, to make a short story shorter, like, we kind of, through those first seven episodes, because he's so good, and everyone's <laughs> elevated their game, and Mike is kicking ass, and Simone's kicking ass, and yeah. Alfrey is, is getting into her own, mm-hmm. and Ron was Jones, and, you know, and, and Rosario, and, and Theo, and every, everything's clicking on all, these, on, all, on all cylinders. And we got right up to the point when we're, you know, episode seven, and, you know, at the table read, man, Alfred was a wreck. She was. She I can like, imagine. That's crazy. I mean, man. Every, everybody was like, we all, love, we, all of us were like, man, are we really going to do this? Should we do this? We're like, <laughs> we're, like, we're, like, we're, like, we're like, you know, we got to stick to the story. And and the only, and the thing was, was the main reason that Mahershala wanted to do the role, other than liking the scripts, was that it was limited. It was going to be seven episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Because he knew. He was also filming Moonlight at the same time, and he was filming. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah, I was just about to ask. He was filming Hidden Figures. Yeah, and so he knew that he didn't want to be tied to a TV series, um, you know, long term. Yeah, these Marvel contracts. I mean, it's real. Like, you, oh, you, they you, lock you down. You, you're locked down for a minute, you know. And so he was like, you know what? I, I don't want to have to deal with the options and everything else. So, so the fact that he's dead, he was he was grateful. He was happy. Yeah, I we just didn't know that by doing that, like. The audience, like once the show came out, people were just kind of. Well, then Infinity War said, "Hold my beer," and then like, you know, right, crazy. <laughs> you know, but I think that goes in just not even just writing, but the way he just performed it. I think that's really what did that. I said it earlier. Like I think he just that initial punch to the punch that made everybody wake up. Like you have a villain. He threw the dude off the you roof. Said, <laughs> you said that basically. People said that Luke Cage was only going to be. A, B, C. You didn't expect there to be a D and an E and an F and a G when you had a real villain walk in here. So I think, like I said, I always liked the fact that that punched you. And Diamondback was no... And I, and I hate how everybody took... Like, even you. I'm looking at you, too. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, the people are... Everybody said, well, Diamondback was it. Well, yeah, I know. Cottonmouth was just so much better. But... Why? Why are we sleeping on Diamondback? Why, why yeah, we man, sleep? I, 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 I always I, hated it. Why are we sleeping on him? He's I, just as confident. I think, if he, not scarier in a way. Yeah. I, I, I think history will will eventually absolve us because exactly because <laughs> what ha- like when people say oh you know got mad I'm realizing they only watched the series over that first weekend mm-hmm. no they, and, yeah. and they just got mad exactly and there was and like Jeff Lowe always says Mahershala couldn't have followed Mahershala. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, mean, and I I feel bad because Eric Lurie Harvey is a great actor. Yeah, and he did his thing, and yeah. I I really enjoyed what he was doing with Diamondback. Yeah, even though he got all this hate, but like he was great. You know, and and even though people are still mad, like you know, um, episode nine, like they, you know, 
there were a lot of great character moments. You know, even though like people were like, well, the mem- you know, like he, Luke was was injured for too long and, and lost two episodes, <laughs> yeah. but. You also have those great interrogations with with with, uh, with Missy Knight, where you kind of learn her background. There are all these different moments that we just, you know, we love dramatically, but I guess people just weren't with us on. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, really, eleven, twelve, and thirteen pick up. Like yeah. really, with with eleven, is um, you know the Harlem's Paradise episode. With, yeah. with, you know, like that. That's really when we finally all, all the. All you know, by Felicia, like like all those little moments, yeah. with, 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 <laughs> Diet Obama, you know, like Diet Obama, <laughs> like you know, like all those little one, one-liners and zingers we were just throwing at, yeah. at the character really began to click, you know, yeah. um, that worked, and then you know, I, it was funny, like we spent all this time and energy on that damn suit, and that was, you know, again to protect the guilty. Um, you know, <laughs> this notion that we have to keep things grounded. And as a result, like anyone that that ha- that's gonna fight Luke Cage, you know, has to have some kind of enhanced suit or weapon in order to fight him. And so oh, that yeah. so that that was how how we 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 spent all this R and D on on this suit, and um, you know, it, the suit just like we are again we start running out of time. Yeah, you know, the suit is what it is, yeah. and we get to set in episode twelve, and Eric comes out. And um, Alfred, this is before the during rehearsal. Alfred said, "What kind of John Paul Gottley a shit is this?" <laughs> <laughs> and I realized at the moment, like, okay, the, the audience is gonna is is gonna that's the, gonna be the reaction. So I made the onset adjustment. I said, "Okay, fuck it, it's funny." Yeah, I yeah. said, "Like, like you, you, you know, black people, like, like when when we were playing the dozens or Jones, and it's like you gotta own it." So, yep. I said, so I said, okay, like, okay, rather than be all insecure about the suit, then fuck it, let, 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 let's be on some beef type shit. Yeah. And so that was the ad lib. But first, at first, you know, it was gonna be, what kind of P-Funk shit is this? Yeah. And then out, after Alfred ad libbed and her reaction, I said, okay, let's give that line, let's give that line to, to Bobby Fish. And then we went from there. Yeah. And then you know, we get through the episode, we get to the fight, um, you know. And it was really just watching the reaction of people. People just wanted, to, they don't care about the signs. They just want to see somebody go toe to toe with Luke and kick exactly. ass. Yeah, that's exactly. all. And, and, that, and that was really the main thing was, was for season two, it was like, okay, like, even though people want this to be grounded, we need to have somebody that has some kind of enhancement without a suit that can fight Luke. Yeah, because you got to right. own, own it and stuff. Because, like, okay, you know, shifting gears and stuff. I liked also the thing with season two. You do do, I don't know if y'all un- knowingly or unknowingly did it. Y'all did set up a lot of Heroes for Hire and Daughters of the Dragon stuff. So how did you go about, particularly, and just to really put it out there, I felt Danny as a character, even in his own season, was not that good. So how did you go about like really improving him, especially with his whole relationship with Luke and such? Well, I'm, I'm arrogant and I'm a little crazy. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I... I, I, I I mean, this is the only thing I'm arrogant about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is, is writing in this show, and I was just like, you know, as a writing staff, we we all we always liked Iron Fist. We 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 liked we liked the character from the comics. Yeah. And we were like, okay, it's like, the whole notion was anybody. It was it was always it was kind of something that that I, I carried as a music journalist, which is that I I, I because there's so many publications. I'm not going to be able to compete with everybody in the interviews Ice Cube, but I know that when I interview Ice Cube, I'm going to, I'm going to make my interview yeah, exactly. different than any yeah, interview he's no ever exactly. done. And so we carried that confidence into how we were going to approach this, was that we we were just going to do Iron Fist for us in our way, mm-hmm. for the Luke Cage way. And um, and that's not to, to, to denigrate anyone that came before us. Oh, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we wanted to make it bespoke for our show. And, you know, um, Akela Cooper, who wrote the episode, um, is, you know, as much of a geek as, you know, as all of us on staff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she had, she also had a passion for it, you know, of like, let, like let's, let's tell a really cool genre story within all this other stuff that's happening. Yeah. And um, it just worked perfectly, you know. Um, and then for me, it's just like, everything for me is music anyway. Yeah. So I initially thought that we were going to score that fight to Wu-Tang Clan nothing to fuck with. And, <laughs> and that would have just, that would have just taken it over the top. But right. the thing was, was we, we, we couldn't clear the song. Oh, okay. So 
um, I just racked my brain and finally ended up with, um, you know, Seventh Chamber Part Two, yeah. and then it just worked so well that uh, we just went, we just went with that, and it's just like everything about you know, from Michaela's script to Andy um, Goddard's direction to you know, stunt choreography, which this year had a different feel. Oh yeah, you, oh, yeah. It, 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 it you, was, you could definitely tell it's a difference because yeah. we we joked on. Um, you know, before we did, like we joked about how like Luke in season one is like Luke didn't have hands in season one. I don't I don't know what happened and stuff, but it's like season two is like, oh yeah, he actually can fight. All right, he cool. went downtown, got some lessons. Like, look, man, <laughs> what, well, you know what it was? I, what, was it, was again first year of a show. Yeah, everybody's nervous. Everybody's nervous. Everyone's telling you what to do and how to do it. Yeah, exactly. And so the whole thing was like if Luke Cage fights somebody and punches him. He's gonna kill him. And so that's when James Liu, the stunt coordinator, and I, like, we just came up with what we call smack food, which yeah. is like, you know, <laughs> like Luke is not, is not kill people is going to like, you know, kind of throw his punches or smack them. And, that, and that's how the whole Christmas Addicts invasion, yeah. about killing yeah. everybody thing happened. But the problem is that when you do that and you stay so realistic, then it's like you have a character that can't really punch. Yeah. And so finally, when we introduce somebody that really could not only punch Luke, but that could take a Luke cage punch without getting killed then Luke could fight yeah. Yeah, and then we can get down yeah. and, and that was just the whole thing was, it's like you know, Superman fighting only robbers like of course yeah. he's gonna do this pull and that punches. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's gonna have to pull the punches so, so that was the thing like you know the one of the reasons that Superman 2 was so good was that like when you, he had, other, finally, when yeah. you had other Kryptonians when you got Zod you, had, you got you could finally do something yeah and so yeah. that it's the same thing for us Like, and that's what I had to say to everybody someone was like man but, because um, my friend who actually defended the fact that Luke couldn't know <laughs> that Luke was so limited. I was like, like, what do you want him to do, man? Kill Cottonmouth the first time you seen him? I was like, yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> but, but I understood it because, like, I think there's that, and then there's like, look, we're trying to tell a story. We're trying to build something around it. So, of course, we're going to have to be limited here and there, even if we want to or if we don't want to. Yeah, so, yeah. But I appreciate the fact that, yeah, it got much, it got much better. That was one of the things I actually kind of praised this season more than last season. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, that was the thing that we wanted to improve all, all, all the way around. It's like, um, you know, after season one, one of the things that, you know, because my, my cult, like, one of the things that's always been at the center of the show is, has been um, my relationship with my culture. Yeah. Because the thing is, it's like, we're like, we're like pretty much the same age. I'm a little older, but like, we're, we're close in age. Um, we actually turns out we were neighbors um, in oh, Studio wow. City, and um, what really galvanized our friendship was, you know, he's coming off Jessica Jones, and he's and he's like, you know, we met a couple of times. He's like, yo, I know that you're show, I know that you're show running Luke Cage, and but nobody was really telling me anything, and this is my whole life, and I'm nervous, and so <laughs> um, like like he's, he's thinking like, you know, like I was one thing on Jessica Jones, I have no idea what the show's gonna be like. I yeah. signed this contract, like. I could be anything, like, you know, yeah. what's it really going to be like? And so it was kind of like one of my first tests as a showrunner because Marvel was like, don't show the script to Mike to anybody. <laughs> and, and Netflix was also was, you know, I didn't have as much of a relationship with them at the time. So, of course, secrecy mums the word. And so um, it's funny. I'll actually show you the picture. This picture right here actually is. Um, let's see if I can get it, o- get it open. Um, this is Mike when he on the day that he, that he met my kids Jomo and Jahi and my daughter Kaya yeah. we, we, we actually um, met in Encino and that's the day that I actually um, unbeknownst to everybody gave him the first two scripts <laughs> <laughs> and I basically said brother you can't copy him you gotta give him back but I'm gonna I'm gonna trust you and that's when the trust between us was first was galvanized was because yeah. you know like Yes, you can end my career by me giving you these two scripts, but this whole partnership is going to depend on on our friendship, yeah. honestly. And so, this is, I'm going to yeah. trust you with this. And then, when he read the first two the first two episodes of Luke Cage, that's when he that's when he was like, "Yo, I'm in. Like, I, like <laughs> let's do this." Yeah, man. And that's really what kind of. But the, but what I'm saying is that after season one, he was he he basically was like, "Yo, it's like um, I don't think you lost interest in, in me." But as a character, as Luke Cage, but it just seemed like it, it was everything was all over the place, and it was just like you know, without being too egocentric, like 
I want to make sure that, you know, for a Luke Cage show, we focus on Luke Cage. Of course. And that was one of the challenges that we, that, that we had for the season is that we wanted to continue with the fascination with the Stokes family, which obviously mm-hmm. was popular with, with, because of Cottonmouth's death and because we have Alfred Woodard and because we got Theo Rossi and that great chemistry, that interesting, weird chemistry. But we needed to make sure that that's happening. Misty Knight is doing, you know, because Simone Missing is such a great actor. We wanted yeah. to make sure that she was engaged. You know, we, we had an incredible thing for, for Rosario, mm-hmm. who, um, even though we only had her for three episodes, we wanted to make sure that that was clicking on, on, on all cylinders. Yeah. Um, but really, on top of all these interesting sidebars, we wanted to make sure that the Luke Cage story yeah. was yeah. strong. And also, of course, with Bushmaster, we're going to bring him into the, into the mix. Mm-hmm. And so that was the thing that was the biggest challenge was that, yes, all these sub-stories are fascinating on their own, but when you get, to, particularly when you get through the entire cycle of 13 episodes, you get yeah. to the end, it remains Luke Cage's story mm-hmm. because he goes through the most changes. You have the whole thing with his father, and then when he makes that shift in episode 13, you like... Hey, let's, let's talk about that. The, the, the last thing you're thinking about, okay, as even though you've seen all these different ensemble yeah. characters up and down and sideways and backwards and forwards, you still are thinking about Luke. It's still Luke's show, mm-hmm. for real. Mm-hmm. And yeah. last time it was like, oh, season one, it was Luke's show, but it was season two. It's, it's the evolution of Luke. I mean, but, but like, okay, so let's talk about that ending and stuff for 13. Because like, that, like, I felt bad because I was like, I should have saw that coming, but I didn't see it coming. So like, so, okay, so... It's like, because you see over the course, you see Mariah literally telling him, like, hey, you really are going to, you know, run in Harlem. And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And eventually he's like, crap, I got to run Harlem now. So, like, how did y'all get to that decision to actually have him kind of sort of be the kingpin of Harlem? Like, to get to that point now where he has to do that now. We knew, we knew pretty early in the writer's room that, that we were going to kill Mariah. Um, like the hows, or was it just you do you were just going to kill her, period? Well, it's just... You know, because of the path she was going to go down, yeah. and because of the people that she was going to kill in the way that it's like it, it, she had to go. <laughs> she was cold blooded now. You know, and and and, and 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 I will also sometimes you guys see, you see it coming. Yeah, and the thing is, is that like I'm lucky that the same relationship I have with Mike, I have with Alfrey, I have with Simone, I have with Theo. Um, you know, I have with virtually everybody on the cast. Mm-hmm. You know, and Alfred, as he started reading the she's like, it's like, lay it on me straight. Y'all, y'all killed me this season, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And you, you, you always are reluctant because, you know, as David Simon says, that if you tell an actor too early that they're going to die, like every scene you hear violins because you know, <laughs> they start acting violins. Violins. <laughs> But to her credit, even though Alfrey knew from, really from episode three that she was going to die, she never she never played into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, um, can't play into a death. Which man. we were yeah. lucky because she was she just remained great mm-hmm. the entire the entire time oh, and consistent. Man. You know, um, and so like, you know, we kind of knew that that was going to be the evolution in terms of like Luke was going to inherit Harlem in some way. We also knew that you know because he was the one that loved Harlem the most that um, it made sense for him to get the club. What we didn't realize was that it was going to be, you know, Tilda that was going to do it. Duh, yeah. You know, yeah. we didn't, it took us a while to kind of get, to get there. Um, we came up with the backstory early on, of course, of, of um, Tilda being, um, you know, Mariah's, Mariah and Uncle Pete's daughter. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we knew that that was going to be a revelation. Great, now I gotta watch the last four episodes of this now. <laughs> oh yeah. no, that's why I stopped that. <laughs> I still haven't seen the last four. Man. Yeah, like I knew she was. Like, let me get break very straight. I knew she was going to die. Everything else I did. <laughs> well, oh, okay. Well, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm no, I'm fine. No, 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 well, no, no, I, no, no. I feel bad spoiling. Oh me. god, no, no, no. Just oh god, no. Do you know how matter. much this man spoils stuff for me? All right, D. You, you ain't gonna watch it. Yeah. I, just tell me what happened, bro. Because <laughs> it's like me where it's like I'm used you, to it. Like, now. you can tell me this ball of it. It's like, I just want to see how it builds up but, to it. But, I'm, no, I'm going to see it, man. You know what was funny was when um, I had dinner with Alfrey, like, at the beginning of the season, of season two. And, she, you know, just kind of let her know what the story arc was. I said, Nate, you could, okay, well, we're going to introduce your daughter. Okay, that's great. And then we're, and then around in the middle of the season, maybe you're eight, eight, nine, or ten, we're, we're going to reveal that. That, that she's your daughter. She's not the daughter of Jackson Dillard. She's actually the daughter of you and Uncle Pete. And she said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when that happened, we, we said, okay, yeah, we got to make it work. And, 
And even within a room, I mean, I got to say, like, it was controversial in, in a room. Like, how are we going to make this make sense? How is this going to work? This could be a shark jump if we do this wrong. Yeah. And yeah. that was what I was, that. and that was the thing that, you know, our whole season, it was pivotal that that moment be right. Yeah. You know, and um, to the point where, like, um, I remember actually flying myself out to set that day. Yeah. From, you know, from Seattle to, to be there because, like, you know, our whole season came down to that argument. Mm-hmm. Or not the argument, that that moment when, um, you know, Mariah is unpacking that awful secret and the fact that she doesn't really love Tilda. Yeah. And then Gabrielle is there listening to all this and the whole thing, you're a monster. And it's just like, on the page, it was one thing, you know. Matt Owens and Ian Stokes wrote a brilliant script, but it wasn't really until, like... It, it was acted both out. actors came to yeah, play it was acted out. that you yeah. just saw like wow like this is not flat at all this shit is real oh yeah and it was just was oh my god it was some of the best acting I've ever seen and it, was, and, it and it made it I mean I, but that was a thing was like like I, as as I told both actresses like you know our season you know if, if people don't believe this moment then everything else is just, I mean because I think it's just wacky because mm-hmm. I think Alfrey she really like acted her behind this yeah. season, it's like she don't get an Emmy for this. Something, I, I, I mean. something. I hope, like, I mean, I, I, I really hope that everyone in the ensemble gets as many accolades as possible because I just really felt that everybody bought it. I thought that, like, you know, I thought Mike bought it in in, in episode three, the argument with Claire. Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. That argument. Yeah. With, that that <laughs> shit. That loved it. That shit was real. That that argument loved with it. them was just like people. You know, the thing is, it's interesting. It's like, um, I know what people are going to think at this point. First episode, they're like, yeah, it's cool. You know, I like it. It's, you know, but it's, it reminds you of what I like about Luke Cage, if I like the show. Yeah. You know, but it's cool. It's all right. See, episode two, okay, well, this is darker than I thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Cause, cause, a bit. Uh, you a know, bit, yeah. and, and, and yes, the music is at the center, and, and you know... I don't know if everyone's a fan of the blues, but, you know, Gary Clark Jr. is doing his thing, and, like, and it's going to bring, you know, some of the white people that, that weren't necessarily deep with hip-hop, but get the blues, and be like, oh, oh yeah. shit, maybe this show is for me. I hate that. I hate that so much. <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, it like, the blues is us. And exactly. Yeah. It's theirs now, I know, but, but, but still. But, 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 but that, still, yes. But that was the thing, was that, because Gary, cause Gary Clark's a hip-hop fan, Gary Clark's a brother, like, yeah, for real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it, he's, he's a child of hip-hop that plays the blues. Exactly. Yeah. So it was important, particularly with him and Christian Kingfish, to... to have black people just recognize the blues is it comes from us, yeah, mm-hmm. and and to not just give it off to rock and roll because rock and roll comes from us too, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so yeah. like it's part of the spectrum, and so and then what what's going to happen is by the time they get to episode three, that's when shit is like, whoa, you've got the daughters of the dragon moment, which is so oh shit, mm-hmm. but then you get this emotional moment you were never expecting with Claire and Luke, and then after Luke gets punched by David back and he's like, hot of the spine. <laughs> he pushed faster, and then it's just like boom. I think, like, like, you're, I think like that, you're off to the races, and I think that's going to be the turning point for a lot of people. I think that the second he get, the second you see Luke get dropped, it's like, <gasps> yo, yo, yeah, like I hope and and, Eddie Gordo and, I, and I always go like I said, and, I, and when it came to Luke Cage, at least the, especially the first season, I drew off my um, my father in law who. Big on black exploitation, big on as you said early on westerns. He's a big western fan. I hate half the stuff he watched, but big on westerns. But he loves that type of setup. And when you see the good guy get dropped, I want to be in the room when he sees that. <laughs> I want to be in the, the that very scene. The second I see Bushmaster, I just want to lean my head into the room. <laughs> well, I mean, when the tra- <laughs> like when the trailer dropped and he showed that scene, that little short scene when he drops him, everybody's like. Who's this guy? And I was yeah. like, Oh, it's Bushmaster guy. It's like, yeah, yeah. Immediately yeah. we had two friends. Man, that's stupid. Like, all right, look, man, look, let's <laughs> just can you watch it first? Can please. we wa- can we get through this first? Yeah. Sick of y'all black folk. But I, mean, I, but I think if we like really wrapping it up, like I think the season overall, like that was one of the big things that I think a lot of people, including myself a little bit, it's like even though I like season one, there was those slow moments. I think with this one, it's like like you said, as soon as you hit episode three. The show doesn't let off the brake. It doesn't even. It, it hits the gas. It's like no, we're gonna keep going with this, but it doesn't in such a way. It's like oh, every episode matters. Like it's not yeah. even like even the slow ones. It matters. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and, and it's, it's just funny because like I mean, um, Piranhas is, is Chaz. You know, um, 
Shepard who plays uh, who plays Prana is, is yeah. hilarious. Um, it's funny. <laughs> I don't know if people remember Chaz. Chaz will actually played um, Jada Pinkett's brother and set it off. Oh yeah, the, 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 yeah. The, the, the one, the one, the one I'm trying to remember. I'm trying. If you watch Set It Off, you know the the, the he was the, the one that got shot. The one that got shot. <laughs> that, that's oh, I don't, that's not funny. Piranha, <laughs> Piranha is great in the movie. In the, in the no, show. no, no. I'm laughing because we did a podcast on it. And I immediately because of you, I thought that joke would be made fun of Jada with old boy. But anyway, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. But I know what you're talking about. But he's great. He, he's really good. Cool well, well, I mean, because because he's great. Anthony Smith is great. Yeah. You know, Thomas Q. Jones. That was the one thing I noticed this season that the acting. The acting just elevated. There, there is much more like side characters. There's me, big there's me. characters. There's, there's meat on the every good. bone on this one. The, not to say that it was bad in the first season, but the second season is something there. It's more robust. Well, that's the thing. It's like I mean, I think one of my favorite surprises is the moments in episode six and seven that that deepen that relationship between Comanche and, mm-hmm. and Shades. Yeah, I mean, people like, like it's so subtle. Like people would be like, some some people are just gonna be going over it, but then other people are like, yo, what? And, and, you know, and then when you get to that moment in in seven, when 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 Shades kills Comanche, yeah, it was. We were really careful with it because the whole thing was we wanted to make sure that it wasn't any latent homophobia, yeah, or or, or self hatred, yeah, exactly. You know, as as to why, you know, um, he killed him. Yeah. That it really was the fact that, as he says, it's just that because I love you, I, I'm blind to your portrayal, and I can't have that shit. Yeah, man. <laughs> like it was just like on, on a gangster level. It was yeah. just one of those things that that was just like yeah. Yeah, Theo Rossi. Dark. Like, he really, he really. I like, mean, but but, but that's the thing. It was, it was you know both actors. I thought. I mean, you know, particularly you know Thomas Q, who you know everyone knows, legendary running running back. But in usually sometimes when people are, are making that transition, they don't take you know athlete actresses seriously. But he he came to she came to show like look he wasn't he didn't come to play he's an he's an mm-hmm. actor's actor. Play. I mean he did a great job I think with that. Yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely. I just, think that that's the one thing. Like I said, not only is the elevation. I think I think the only like, I think there'd be less. No, actually I think it'd be just as many people many black. Black people on Twitter either complaining or praising it. I think it'd be the same. No, I really think it's going to be a lot of Team Bushmaster. Oh, there's going to be a lot of... Because if Killmonger taught me anything, there's going to be a lot of black people that's going to side with the heel like always. But they did the same thing with Kyle. But I mean, but they've done the same thing. You guys did Bushmaster in a way where it was like, oh, there's a deeper reason why he is what he is. But you don't sympathize and was like, you're still wrong, dude. Like, you know... Because you're going to get two people... I believe in just the person or I believe in the cause. There were people that said, Oh, I'm just I'm just gonna side with him because he's the bad guy. And then you got people like, No, what he stands for. He's the right one in this situation. I'm gonna back him up. That's gonna be the same one. I think it's probably gonna be a little bit more than last season. Yeah. It's gonna be a little bit more than last season. I think there's just more with Bushmaster than it was with um Diamondback, especially with Diamondback, because so many people are so split on him. So that's why I feel that's <laughs> so why I feel the whole season with Bushmaster, it was like Oh, this is basically what you would get if you had a, di- a, a cotton mouth that actually just throughout the whole season. Yeah, exactly. He's doing his own thing and he has a plot. Because, like I said, I still love the line. It's like, no, it's Stokes. Mariah Stokes. Like, <laughs> every time I was like, yo, that is hilarious. He does not like Dylan. You need to announce that. All. This is drink. Yeah, that's a drinking game to me. Yeah. That's a straight up drink game. Make sure you do it, man. It's like Mariah Dillon. No, it's Stokes. Jamaican rum, too. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yo, like, we got to get sponsored by Bath and Rum. <laughs> I mean, but, but, that, but that was the thing, was just like, you know. I'm really, really proud of just how the entire season came together. And even just the stuff that we did, like very few, some people won't even realize it, but like when we did the flashback with the Bushmaster flashbacks, we actually shot those scenes in Jamaica. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm, wow. Yeah, like so, like. I thought it was like soundstage. No, no. We shot off at, at Strawberry Hill in Kingston wow. and we shot in Trench Town. Like, wow. Like, so, like, that was real. And so. You know, knock on wood, if, if if we're lucky enough to give a third season, you know, like, the fact that we were able to do that, I'm hoping that we, we can expand in different ways. I hear that. You know. I but, definitely you know, hear that. But, but that was what was so fascinating about just the whole season was that, like, um, we were able to really have every, all our major characters have these incredible moments. Yeah. But then we didn't lose Luke Cage and all that. Oh, no. And that when you get to that ending, when you get to Luke being the gangster... And that moment, and that really, that question is, 
by controlling crime, are you a crime boss? Yeah, because I mean, um, what's his face? Uh, DW. Kid, DW, like, mm-hmm. used the look on his face of just like, I can't believe... You. No, no. But, no. But, but, that, but, you know, but, that, but, that, but that's what's so funny. It was like, you know, it's really, again, everything for me is about The Wire. Yeah. And what I've always loved about The Wire is that even small characters can have big, can have big yeah. moments. Mm-hmm. So DW has some great moments this season. And then Sugar. Like, oh, I, man, look, I loved Sugar as, like, he evolved from, like, well, he was that dude that Luke beat up in season one, and then, like, season two, he kind of slowly evolved into, yeah, me and Luke are best friends now. We're cool. But, you know, <laughs> but the thing the thing was, was that, like, the actor, um, Sean, like, um, it was something about the way that he said that line, I don't even like these niggas, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> it made you immediately sympathetic to the character. And you know, and then later on, like my, my other favorite line for the ad from from season one was when he said, "Sit your fine ass down." <laughs> <laughs> in the club in episode eleven, yeah. like we just love sugar. Like there were a couple of times when when we could have killed him off. We were like, "No, nah, yeah. there's something about." Well, I like how I gave him a background in season two of like, "Oh yeah, I got a family over here, and the Stokes they took me in, and they they helped me out." And it's like, "Oh, but okay. that like another moment that that I love in the finale is is like when Mariah is just you know basically." Gives Order sixty six is gonna wipe yeah. out everybody. <laughs> you, 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 you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then and then she's asking, and it's and then and, and then the course of lawyer kid says, "What about sugar?" And he's like, "She's like, nah. His wife gave me clothes. I'll never forget that. Like, it was, yeah, it's, it's like, like one ah. little moment of kindness. It's like ah. it, it explains yeah. a lot. And then, <laughs> then even like doing his whole backstory, and it's just like, yeah, it's just cool that everybody gets a moment. Yeah, you know, um. Also, what was great, honestly, was um, Simone Missick um, in terms of her portrayal of Misty, really giving her a soul, and at the same time, like showing her struggle with, the, with getting the arm, and then when she has the arm, you know, it's it's it's, it's a different Misty too. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, you had her and her husband in the show yeah, too yeah, and stuff, and, and, and they, they, they like knowing the fact that they're married and stuff. I like just. Like the dynamics of that whole scene with both of them, it's actually pretty fun to actually watch and stuff. Well, it was that was what was funny in episode one was like, um, like I loved watching Dorian because I Dor- Dorian's an old friend of mine. Like we actually worked together on Southland. Yeah, I see, yeah, I've seen them before. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so it was just fun watching him. He would constantly push Simone's buttons. <laughs> you could see it a couple of times. And, like, and, and she, she, she really, he really started ticking her off, and, and like, and like we just kept throwing like these one-liners, like, like you know, like yeah, why well, go to Fox with really one arm bandit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, or like, like yeah, you know, we, you know, we can always get a parking space. Like, I just kept throwing like there are all these lines, and then each with each one, like Simone started getting angry. And it was great, like you know. <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, it was it was it was even cool being being able to bring back um, Scarf, yeah. you know, for that flashback. I mean, you know, because people are, are just as much as 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 it might have been a mistake to kill off Cottonmouth, it was also a mistake to kill off Scarf. Yeah, I didn't see that coming. Actually, I was like, you eh, might go to jail. That's about it. Because <laughs> Frank Wally is is such a great guy, and such a great character, um, you know, and they had such great rapport as partners, yeah. you know. Um, but then the, the, that's the thing that's cool is, is being able to set that precedent where, you know, you never know who's going to show up in a flashback. Yeah. So, so, you know, we'll see. I always love that. I mean, was there? I always love that too. When it, when you, especially when you have a show that has so many characters and people that get knocked off, locked up, whatever, and you have a flashback. Ah, there he is. That's always. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, it's just that remembering of like, oh, at one point, you know, they were, that's, that's who they that's were. Always, you know? That's <laughs> always fun. And it's you know, the only thing you can pray is the actor didn't get fat or something like that. Yeah, he <laughs> and it looked different. Well, it's like, they didn't look like that at all. Or something like that. Well, that was also fun, like, honestly, like, um, on Twitter, after after seeing, you know, Infinity Wars, and when, when I when I wrote that tweet the night after, I said, I said, and y'all niggas still mad about Cottonmouth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> they killed, like, they 15 killed people. Every, like, everybody. They oh, man. It, it was just... It was like this cathartic moment because it was like that's when people were just like, like oh thank God they were just able to almost have fun with it now they yeah, yeah. weren't as angry but everybody that's the that's the thing me and him we watch we watch wrestling so yeah. we see people go through emotions like not curse again lose why that happened why that happened two months from now you're gonna forget yeah you we really don't are <laughs> eventually you're gonna be like oh, this is an issue now you're gonna forget later on yeah. but it's just interesting because it's like you know being a former critic. 
and everything else, like, I have a pretty thick skin. I mean, Angelica J. Bastian, who um, did all the recaps for Vulture, um, she wrote some of the most scathing reviews. Oh, I read them. I read but them. I, but I loved them. Because they were they were so well written. Because they were honest, you know. They were honest and so well written. I mean, because I, I I talked to her recently, and I was just and I I basically called her like my Pauline Kale, because like, like yeah, it was painful as hell, but they were they were so such brilliantly written reviews, mm-hmm. and so heartfelt. Like, you know, it really helped us because the one thing she kept saying was it was like it's too bad they didn't imagine Luke Cage as a man instead of just as a hero, and that was the one thing we said from the jump. Because I had the entire writing staff, like we read them all the reviews together, and we're like, okay, let's make sure that we attack that. But you know, that's the thing. It was like the the I, the only review that I've seen so far that's kind of bothered me has been the IGN review. Yeah, like, I think the way they review it, it's, it's weird because you have to kind of like. Because for me, it was like I saw it, and using my first instinct is to do a review immediately. It's like you know, I gotta let it kind of digest a little bit before we even do it. Thank God they had like an embargo for it, so it gives you time to kind of like. Oh, yeah. Let me let me let me really think on this. That's one thing we I do it very early, and I told I forgot what movie that was we saw, and I was like, he like, hey, dude, let's do a review. But I'm like, no, no, let's do it tomorrow. What are we doing tomorrow? Just think do on it. Tomorrow. it. <laughs> Just think on it. Just you let it do, do it. it. And that's that's why my first reaction. But I get, but see, I, I say I get why you know if it's a movie, if it's a TV show, whatever it has to be, you want to get it out there as soon as possible, and you want to give it your. All. Sometimes you have to digest it. Yeah. Sometimes, not all times, but you know. Then again. I think everybody at G ain't that really good, so <laughs> yeah, but, but, I wouldn't be bothered by. But, but it was just interesting because because he was like like the reviewer said there was a story not worth telling and and and, and said the whole show <laughs> suffers from no cotton mouth. I'm like I'm like come on like give the show a chance. Yeah, you know and like. But I think I, it's one of those things where it's like and then it, yeah. And then I mean, that. as a reviewer, you have to kind of like all right. Be critical, but I think some people, and this is kind of like for Put us in, in our in our and what we do with with like just podcasting or just doing anything with pop culture and stuff. A lot of people like to throw hot takes because that's going to get yeah. people to read it, and it's like, but is that really how you feel? And it, and, it, and it ticks us, off, and it ticks me off because I tell you because I will immediately stop, you know, put my foot down as leader. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. D, I got a hot take. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> D, this is a good, this is a prime example for us to catch a wave. Like, I'm, don't catch this wave because yeah. that wave is people not thinking, people trying to get seen, whatever it may be. And sometimes, like I said, you just have to just digest it, just to see what it is. And when I hear it, like, this suffers from no cotton mouth. Okay, dude, did you even look? Did you did even you look? <laughs> Were you just in there like, Puh, my favorite character's gone. Now I want to sit here with a stank face the whole time. <laughs> Watch it. You know what? So I feel bad for you. <laughs> That's how I feel. I don't understand how you do that. I never understand how anybody does that. You know, but like, here's the thing. It's like, um, you know, cause it's just that some people are going to love the show. Yeah. And, and some people aren't. Some people are just are never going to get over, you know, the, the death of Cottonmouth. The, 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 the only thing is, is that I know that collectively as a writing staff, as an acting staff, as a crew, mm-hmm as a collective people that worked our asses off that we could not have done anything more and yeah. we just put it all out of the field and like mm-hmm. my, my last sports met- metaphor for tonight is that moment um, you know when it was the Titans versus the Rams and the Titans were that one yard mm-hmm. short oh, yeah. and they were just reaching out and, and my man was <laughs> on the ground yeah. and he was just like and it's short yeah. but he left it all on the field like that's what I feel like this season. It's, it's like I hope we win the Super Bowl, but if we don't, it's just that we ran out the clock and we were just an inch short. But we really tried our yeah. hardest to kind of just do yeah. everything that. that we could. And um, you know, I just wanted just to thank you guys for because um, I heard the the, the non spoiler review, and I just loved the, just how honest you were about what you liked about the show, what you didn't like about the show. Yeah. And it was just, it's just really, it's been a pleasure to just to talk about all this stuff and tell these stories, mm-hmm. man. Trust me, it's, you it's know. definitely been a huge it's pleasure. Honor, like I said, honor, it, really it, it, it kind of threw us off because, like I said, it's just you never know who's listening. So it was just for us, it's like, I don't, I mean, you look at Twitter and it's such kind of like you get hyped that, oh, this celeb's following you, but you don't know if they're actually listening. And then it's like the fact that you listen to it now, it's like, I wonder if William Sadler listens to us. Oh, my God. William Sadler. (laughs) Does he listen to us? Because he follows us. And then it's like there's other celebs that follow us, like legit follows. And it's like, 
I would huh. die laughing at that. Because we had Carl Jones. I didn't know Carl Jones. Um, Boondocks and um, yeah. what else he did? You know, um, Black... Not, not Black, Black Yeah, he, yeah, he, he did Black Yeah, he, he helped was part of yeah, Black yeah. Dynamite and stuff. But yeah, didn't know he listened to us. That blew my mind. That blew my mind totally. Yeah, because he was the one that off the break when we interviewed. He's like, I've listened to you guys before. And it's like, <laughs> wait, wait, wait a minute. You wait, never wait, know wait. who's listening to you. You know, I always said... And it's not even just, you know, I say that to everybody that follows us and people that listen to us. You never know who's looking at you, listening to you. Because, and I always say that your words have power. No yeah. matter what you think, your words have power. Whether they be positive or negative. Like you just said, the reviewer for Vulture killed you. But you was like, yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you. I <laughs> thank wanted you. I that. Need that. And then you have some people like, all right, dude, whatever. I'm just going to scroll down on Twitter. I'm not even going to look at you. And then sometimes you say something that brightens somebody's day, fuck that, maybe their life. So you never know. So, I'll, yeah. so you never know. That's so what I'm pr- trying to say is try to say to everybody, don't be a prick. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on. But yeah, come on, it's, it's, it was definitely nice talking to you. It's yeah, definitely man. definitely appreciate it. I didn't expect it at all. So this has actually been pretty awesome. So. No, thank you. Thank <laughs> yeah, you again. Yeah. Yeah. No, no problem. No absolutely. problem. Yes, yes, thank yes. Thank you again. Yes. All right. All right. All right. Catch you later. Yeah. Shin, 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 shin,